Welcome to the Buy Box Bandits podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Buy Box Bandits podcast, episode 185. Uh, we took about a month or so off because we were busy launching Boxum, which is our brand new Amazon FBA shipment tool, which uh, publicly released yesterday. Um, so if you want to send inventory to Amazon, uh, faster. It's a lot more clean. You can say goodbye to clunky software. You can try it out completely free at boxum.com, B-O-X-E-M. And if you want to see it in action, you can check out uh, either my uh, YouTube tutorial or the Boxum YouTube channel um, to see full tours of how Boxum works. It's also the official sponsor of the Vivox Bandits from here on out. It was very hard to not say anything about it, but here we are. Garrett's got the shirt on. I got the shirt on. We got Pete the shirt as well. He got recognized for it in Miami last week too, which True, is pretty cool happen. as as well. But going to dig in on all things back to school today, guys. So what you're going to expect from this episode is going to be uh, everything you need to know to dial in your merchant field strategy, everything you need to know for back to school sourcing as well, right? And then a bunch of tips and tricks in regards to proc research and just doing that right. And then overall, just a holistic view of what you're going to expect for the next 45 days um, as we get into one of the easier parts of the year that also repeats every year, which is great as well. So we're going to be able to come back to that um, as as well, right? So basically want to just dive in. Um, so Peter, you want to break down uh, basically where you were at last year prior to back to school and then where, where you were at immediately after back to school because there's a massive difference in terms of where you were at as a seller, right? Yep. Yeah, so um, going into back to school, I think that my top month, it was right around 50K and then in back to school, we hit 130 um, and then was able to parlay that into Q4. So you take all of that capital that you've made and you can really deploy it in an even easier time to sell, which would be Q4. So it's really, really important to get momentum in back to school, in my opinion. The momentum I think, and really I think the cool thing too. about back to school in general, specifically, you know, focused on newer sellers is it gives you kind of the, the glimpse of and the excitement of potential that that wholesale provides. Right. And we've talked about this a couple of days ago, right? On the Money Monday, or I guess yesterday, is that the really comp the real compounding nature of this business is the ability to go deep on products, right? To scale your business in depth as opposed to width. It's a lot easier to spend a hundred thousand with one supplier across a couple of brands on a couple across a couple of products than twenty thousand spread across five different suppliers or spread across two hundred products, right? So that all money spent is not created equally. And I think that's really where back to school gets exciting and it opens you up to the potential of this business because you can buy a hundred of a product of a specific ASIN and have it sold within a day or two, right? And it's so much easier to buy deeper as opposed to wider, right? And that's, I think, the huge lesson that a lot of people can begin to take away from the potential of Amazon and, of course, obviously just the potential of this season. Yeah, that was a really good point in regards to going deep on stuff too. Because I remember my first back to school in 2021, and and that was yours too, Garrett. Right? We were we were cooking along around like you know 30, 50k a month, and then boom, July hit, and you did about 100, and I did like 60, and then I had my first 100k a month in August, which was literally just in like a two week yeah. period. Miles just was all this man, so he just started lapping me. Yeah, well, not naturally, <laughs> right? But it, but the key was though, right? Is it was it was at like a really convenient time of the year when it's way less risky to, especially as a newer seller, to buy heavy on something, uh, knowing you're gonna sell it all tomorrow because you sold 50 yesterday. It's a lot easier to buy 100 or something when you sold 42 yesterday or 36 yesterday or 57 yesterday. And during back to school in Q4 is when you get those times when you can really increase, you know, your confidence around stuff. So we've seen it with me, Garrett, Jake, Danny, right, Peter, uh, you know, your whole generation kind of with like, uh, you know, Dre, Mason, Max, the other Max, etc. You can make massive progress just in the next 45 days. And this podcast is going to break down everything you need to know to go ahead and do that. Right. That, that's a that's a crucial point because. And, and we're going to get this from a lot of newer sellers. It's like, oh, Garrett, like I'm not comfortable spending 100 or sp buying 100 units now. You don't have to be, right? You can replace and compromise speed with experience, with competence, right? You, you, you don't need to have the confidence to buy 200 units, 300 units, 500 units of a particular item. Not on the first iteration. You don't need it. Maybe buy 5 or 10. And again, as Miles was suggesting, let the market authenticate what we're all talking about, what you suspect of a product. So buy five, they sell out today. Well, maybe next time, now you can buy 15. Awesome, fantastic. Whatever that number is for you, whatever that iteration is for you, stick to that and iterate and iterate and iterate 
And of course, FDM allows a lot of this to happen, right? Because with FBA, you send in 15 and now it's four weeks later, they all sell on a day and now you're kind of screwed. And so FBM is going to be huge because it allows you to replace that experience, that confidence with just speed in the marketplace. And again, we were talking about this yesterday. You can couple one listing, one ASIN with four or five different unilateral ASINs, one backpack, one, one Nike backpack on five different of the same ASINs. And so all of that to say, if you're, if you're a new seller, you can still take advantage of a lot of this market by not having a whole sort, sorts of confidence, by just simply be willing to act fast. Yeah, because with FBM, right, you get to sell something tomorrow potentially right? You miss out on all that or you avoid, not necessarily miss out, you avoid all that lead time, right? So in terms of, you know, breaking that down, right? The reason why that's so important this time of year is because there's little, there's like a 45 day gap between pretty much now and like early September, September 1st, mid-September, 45, 60 day gap here where demand increased on lots of different products. We're going to talk about how to find them later to start in terms of important dates you need to know for back to school. So it's pretty much like July 15th. So yesterday, right? To like September 15th. Now, different products pop off at different times, right? So it's not like on September 15th, every listing becomes not profitable. And July 15th, yesterday, every listing became profitable. There's new stuff you're going to find as the season evolves, right? However, what I've seen, what Garrett's seen, what Peter's seen is where you get the majority of your results is going to be from a small subset of your ASINs. Right. So I know Pete, that was exactly what you did last year. So you want to kind of break down how you go ahead and find those and eventually like know when it's time to buy heavy on stuff as a result of that. Yeah. So, I mean, the market's going to tell you, I mean, really what you're looking to identify are keep a charts that are really decreasing rapidly in offer count. Right. And so if you identify those and then you can go FBM on those, you're going to see massive results very, very quickly allowing you to compound exponentially throughout the month or month and a half that we're going to be in back to school. Right. And a listing doesn't just go from like a 35, 40% ROI to a 0% ROI, right? right? It, It gradually slows down over time. Therefore, the market just tells you when each listing isn't good, right? On the flip side, in terms of important dates of when do you start FBMing heavy, when the market tells you to, when you see certain SKUs where you're like, I don't think I should take the time to FBA this because I can see that 30% of the buy box share is going FBM and the offer counts decreasing and the price is starting to trickle up naturally. Right. So like important dates really gets going from July 15th to August 15th or to September 15th. It's like a two month period that started basically yesterday. Right now you need to look up if your state has a sales tax holiday. It's a really gangster way to save some sales tax. It's literally just a thing different states do. A lot of states have them. They all happen at different times um, where you have some time where you can do retail arbitrage sales tax free, all in arbitrage sales tax free. Right. And then really the main, main dates are going to be between August 5th and August 20th. Right. In terms of industry wide, however, each listing pops off at a different time. Like I'll never forget Pete, you and Max going back to the hotel to reprice certain ASINs throughout the day. Right. And, and the reason why you do that is because you have so much invested in it. And so going up in a dollar fifty in on the reprice or minimum, which is how you change price, you raise the reprice or minimum, might get you 70 extra dollars that day if you can grab buy box for six hours on a listing that's absolutely printing and sure. sell an extra 50 a little bit higher. Right. And I think that's a really, really big misconception new sellers have is like you don't set a price, you currently set a price. And if something's selling really well, raise it. Like in my, uh, in my coaching group, we were all playing around, um, with stuff today, basically. And I was like, all right, like play around with testing some prices out higher. If something's selling well for you, and there were so many examples. I raised it from 98 to 106, and I made an extra eight bucks profit on that. I raised from 22 to 26 and now I just sold 12 extra units and made an extra 50 bucks profit. That stuff, other people aren't doing that you can do that yield huge results as well. hundred percent. I think one point about the the demand within back to school is unlike Q4, it's a little wavier because all of the different schools have different schedules. So if you are ripping on an ASIN that slows down for a little bit, make sure that you're doing your due diligence around price and that you're still competitive and offer count isn't going up, but it might be a little bit wavier just because people are buying at different times throughout that month. The other thing to note is a lot of this, a lot of these sorts of products are going to be kind of redefining what you typically are looking for in a product. Right, because it's the, the 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 demand is just so high, right? And I know there's a lot of attention on the the Crayola listings, right? A lot there are a lot of you know the offer counts are already going up, 
But when you actually look at the numbers, right, some of these off accounts were at like 80, 90, 110, 130, 150, right? In 10 months out of the year, that's a problem, right? Especially when they start at like 8 or 10 or 15. But if you actually sit down and look at it, okay, well, the off account went, up, went from 8 to 150, fine. We'll say maybe 20% of those people, 30% of those people maybe have five units, four units. Maybe another 10, 15% are priced way too high, right? So A, that off account really doesn't necessarily mean anything when you start to peel back the layers of the onion. But on top of that, if you just look at what the sales rank becomes, what the demand becomes, right? A lot of these listings at the peak are going to sell at a rate of 16,000 times a month, 20,000 <laughs> times a month, 25, 30, right? These sales rank, if you look at the past couple of years of, of data, all the sales ranks are dropping to like 20, 20, like literally 20 in toys or office products. So what are that number is, right? And so if you use Jungle Scout, you correlate that to an actual number, what you'll find is a lot of these listings are selling tens of thousands of times over the course of a couple of weeks, right? And I mean, do the math, 20,000 sales at a clip of, you know, with 50, 100, 150 offers on the listing. It's not as drastic, not as as troublesome as as in, uh, initially anticipated, just by the fact that I mean that's hundreds of sales per day, and then you have, of course compound that with most of the sellers will probably only have a couple units, and then on top of that again like we've already kind of you know drilled into you guys, well you're gonna have and you're gonna be on seven different ASINs, and so you stop up stock up on. 200, 300, you know, 24 packs of crayons, you're on the one pack, the two pack, the six pack, the 12 pack, the 24 pack, all of those listings are going to tens of thousands a month. It's almost impossible to lose. It's simply just a matter of how many units you can get your hands on. Right. And so again, 10 months out of the year, these sorts of keep graphs, keep, keep a graphs would be problematic in terms of that drastic offer count. Right. But of course, consider the fact that the sales ranks are, are dropping so low, the demand is so high that you're still going to be able to win. Yeah, and not every rank is created equal to like right. you know uh, the sporting goods sales ranks during football season and soccer season and what backpacks fit into are way different than in April, right? And that a hundred k rank or a hundred k rank is way different than a hundred k rank during prime time in Q four as well, right? So the you got to consider like volume increases massively, and the cool thing is you're only going to buy Cuba charts that look good in the first place. So you're not going to speculate on anything. Garrett also brought up a great point about multiple listings. This is a massively important thing that's a little bit confusing, but we definitely like this might even be the first time we've ever said it on the pod. A lot of it, a lot of products will have multiple Amazon listings. You have to make sure it's the same thing and you can list on both at the same time, which is magical, right? And it's like, all right, what does that actually look like? You have 10 of these, whatever these are called converters sitting next to you. There's five on one ASIN, five on the other ASIN and in general, typically one will do better than the other, but you spread the stock out equally and then allocate as the market tells you to. Massive, massive hack. Go through your catalog tonight. Hit the main keyword. See if you're missing anything. Another great way to do that is to just storefront stock your competitors and see if you have any blind spots around that too. Right? You just obviously have to make sure it's the same item. Garrett brought up a good point with the multi-pack for that too. Right? Now, we had a, I got a text this morning. Homie, got a, homie shipped a product from New Jersey to New York for five bucks and the customer paid 50 bucks for extra for expedited FBM shipping, right? <laughs> so shipping templates. Pete, fill the boys in on FBM shipping templates because this is something you have to do. Most people don't do it and they end up losing money as a result of it. So you have to make sure you have your FBM shipping templates dialed. Yep. Uh, so so some core components of the, uh, the shipping template, obviously you want to be in zero day handling so that you're extremely competitive and that Amazon will prioritize your listing. And then we really want to, we want to give free shipping for just the normal purchase. Um, and then we would go ahead and then kind of charge the moon for expedited. So if you're doing two day, you know, throw, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks plus a buck, like a buck. Oh, no, nah, that's nothing. No, no, no. Two day, two day next day, expedited 30 bucks, 50 30, 40. Bucks, that's fine. Too. Like that. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. We, we, yeah, definitely like play around in like the different, uh, shipping providers, whether it's VQ, Shippo, Pirate Ship, get a sense of how much it's going to cost you to ship to different parts of the country. So you don't lose money and then price like two times, whatever the max price is um, for like the largest amount that you would possibly ship. Yeah. So the cool thing with that is that, you know, if you have that dialed correctly, right, Pete brought up a great point, zero to handling time. That means you have to ship the procs quicker, but you also get a ton of extra buy box share, which is super worth it. 
right? Super worth it, especially to get your account churning in the buy box algorithm. Fun fact, I've actually never been in zero day handling time because my, yeah, my account's so deep in the FBM algorithm that it doesn't matter, right? Garrett's probably the same way too. We didn't even know about that stuff back in the day, right? We didn't even know that stuff back in the day. We're using multiple listings like crazy though, right? So say you have your shipping templates dialed and you get an order and you ship it out today and it's an expedited order and the customer paid $35, but because you're shipping it quick, you're only charged $13. That gives you back an extra, whatever the spread of that was. I, I believe it was 13. He wasn't even going to try to Yeah, yeah. Try. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? You don't want to get roasted in front of everyone. <laughs> facts, 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 right? Exactly. So that gets you extra profit, right? So FPM shipping templates are super, super important, right? Standardize it for the most part. You might play with it a little bit on your own, but something along the lines of free for economy and standard, right? And then like $30 or $40 or whatever, plus a dollar per pound for next day, two day expedited. Also make sure in your shipping settings, you, some accounts will randomly have like major shipping services, not selected. Mm. Uh, I don't know how that happens, but it happened with one of my guys this week. So it's super important, right? To dial that in. Now, occasionally Amazon's going to charge the moon. They're going to just, they're going to request you to pay the moon. You never pay the moon, right? You go over to Vico, you go over to pirate ship and you buy the shipping on there. Uh, almost never should you be taking L's on FBM shipping costs. If you have your templates, correct. Right. It only takes once. I mean, Miles, you and I back in the day, years ago, I know we both made the mistake where you got stuck with the next day, two day, whatever the case may be. You have to pay forty dollars, thirty dollars for shipping. They, they, they Always, only, yeah, they only paid fifteen. Of course, we ended up canceling those guys and kept it rolling. But like, hey, you, hey, we're not recommending y'all do that. <laughs> <laughs> you you do what you got to do, though. <laughs> I mean, it is it worth noting, so right, that Amazon ensures the shipping purchase through its platform. Obviously, that's something to keep in mind if you're, you know, looking elsewhere for that FBM shipping. If anything gets lost, stolen, damaged, late, et cetera, it's going to be harder to, you know, have the backing from Amazon if you're not buying it from them. But I mean, just something to keep in mind, not a huge deal. But if you're buying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of labels through an outside source, something to definitely keep in mind. Yeah. Well, then to yeah, piggyback sure. off that, Garrett, yeah. yeah. Um, Probably a good idea to put some thought into all the buyer messages templates because you're going to be getting messages. Yes. And you, you don't yeah. want to spend a modicum of energy responding right. to those. That's a so, serious life lesson, too. That really is. Right. Yeah. No response yeah. needed. No, I mean, if you're paying attention, very, very important. So, um, what we got to go ahead and do is just have everything in a template. And then we're just automatically like responding to that. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. No thought of, yeah. yeah. And then just be familiar with like the A to Z claim. Make sure that, you know, if they Ooh, say something yes. didn't get delivered and you have a delivery confirmation, you'd be like, go file the A to Z and then Amazon will cover you. That's a very good point. Dig, yeah. Dig that. That it, describe what an A to Z claim is. Yeah. So A to Z is a, um, it's a program or like a policy that protects the customer when they're involved with third party sellers. And so it also protects you when mm -hmm. you purchase your shipping through Amazon. Bingo. So very, very nice to have if, you know, USPS dropped the ball, then you can just say, hey, go file an A to Z Which claim. You'll get credited. Yeah, never definitely. Happens. That definitely does never happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just be prepared for that because you don't want to be just wasting energy on that. In the, yep. in and the just program. in general, if you're a new seller, you are going to see anti-FBM propaganda on the Internet from people that have been doing this for years. You have to scrap, claw, and fight your way to build proof of concept and make money fast with this stuff. It's tough because you want to take advice from sellers who have been in the game for years, but they're sharing what they're doing, right? They have a mature Amazon business. They have a prep center. They've delegated stuff. That's not how they got there typically. They got there by doing whatever it takes. And you can make massive progress in the next 45 days by dialing in back to school and really cleaning up on some of these types of listings right here. So pretty much the last component on purely the FBM side of things, right, is what shipping supplies do you need, right? So literally one of the first things G-Body Vans ever helped me with back in the day was the polymash from Amazon, right? 9 by 12, 12 by 15, 19 by 24 should pretty much cover everything you need, right? Just get them on Amazon, gray and black, nice and easy. Don't, don't worry about that. Nice and easy, right? Now, uh, boxes, Uline, Walmart couple good places to get them. Um, anywhere else for boxes? I mean, it's pretty staples occasionally. It's whatever. Yeah. You, you know where Home you Depot, need it. it yeah. Yeah. Bottom off Amazon. Yeah. Just make sure they don't have branding on them. So if you can yeah. see it say Walmart on it, do not use it, uh, especially if it's very clear. Um, because 
then if a customer says, oh, if a really weird customer thinks you're drop shipping it, you'll get in trouble with Amazon. I mean, right. I, to be honest, I, I really wouldn't even look to FPM anything that, that can't fit in a bag, right? If you have to start worrying about boxes and taping Thanks boxes and finding too, the right yeah. size of box, man, there, there's so few things that don't go in, a, that cannot go in a bag. And I would just restrict your FBM to things that can go in a bag. It, it, you're going to, it's so much easier, so much quicker. You don't have to tape boxes. You don't have to find the right box, throw it in the bag, tape it up. You're good to go. Another decent thing with that, so I can actually completely disagree with that, because Stanley Cups, one of the legendary OA items, had to go in a box, right? So just, just in general, though. But once again, that's G-Body Benz with a mature business. He gets to choose, right? If you're sub 10K a month profit, I don't think you should choose, right? I think you should take whatever you can get, right? Um, but in general, with uh, with that, I completely forgot what I was going to say in regards to uh, that, to that, uh, that next point there. But it, it was something that was relevant, so I'll remember it, too, right there. So... Okay. Um, how to tell if a listing is merchant fulfilled friendly? Ooh, very, very huge. Different. I mean, you already kind of touched on it, right? So you want to start in that data buy box, right? What you're looking for is is not not so much an exact number, but just some movement FBM, right? So there's a little check marks next check box under that. I think it says FBA or I think it's FBA, right? The check marks are going to be for FBA sellers. If there's no check box, it is an FBM seller. Again, you're not looking for a 15% going to FBM, 10%, 20%. You're not looking for an actual number. You're just looking for numbers. You're just looking for sellers in the action, in the picture, FBM. Now, on top of that, you can actually start to source only FBM listings with Keeper Product Finder. right? So that's going to open you up to specifically listings that currently have an FBM seller in the buy box, which is huge, right? So because, you know, come December and even here in a couple of weeks, you can start to do sourcing just based on listings that have maybe a certain sales rank under a certain brand parameter without Amazon in the picture and a third party FBM seller in the buy box. Well, that gives you a whole lot of um, warm leads to now choose from and now reverse back to a site, right? So of course, on an individual listing basis, you can just go and quickly validate that there are some FBM sellers in the picture, winning sales, winning the buy box. Um, and of course, you can filter and start to source for those particular listings using a tool like Keep a Product Finder. Now, on the, on the contrary, right, the thing that you're really trying to avoid is every single listing in the buy box FBA, right? It's not always going to happen, but in terms of just filtering your listings, qualifying your listings, you're just looking for those sort of skewing factors, right? I talk about it with variations a lot. I talk about it with sellers owning like 90% of the buy box, 95% of the buy box. Now, in, in this scenario, right, you just want to probably avoid any listing that you don't see any FBM sellers um, just to kind of, you know, increase your chances of success just a bit. Yeah, but if other people are doing on a listing, you can too. Hundred percent, hundred percent, right? So that data buy box statistics on uh, Keepa is key, right? I also a lot of people don't know you can customize your seller amp tiles. I like moving up the offer count tile so you can see right below the prof calculator the spread of FBA to FBM. Because like if a listing has even twenty five percent FBM sellers, there's such a high chance that you can FBM on it because those people aren't dumb. They aren't listing on it for no reason. Like they're they're pretty much getting sales, and then it further gets validated. By oh, I actually didn't know stuff. that. Oh yeah, you can move it all over the place. Yeah, maybe. I super did not know that. Right now, the cool thing is with that too. Further along, right? If there's no buy box, don't automatically avoid it. If Amazon's on it, don't automatically avoid it. If there's no sales ring, don't automatically avoid it. Look at the keep it chart. If something has no buy box, it's automatically FBM friendly because the sales just go to whoever's lowest because that's what the customer sees right there. So, and it just kind of in general too, like there's a lot of good wealth and no sales rank stuff and no sales rank stuff tends to have a lot of low competition, um, fairly unrelated in regards to the, the merch field stuff though. As a result. So yeah, right. Very, very important there. Uh, what sells best, right? Pretty easy. You kind of already know, right? Backpacks, school supplies, calculators soccer gear, football gear, et cetera, right? But how do we actually find listings like that? That's the hard part. How do we find good, per good performing Amazon listings in those niches? Pete, you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, sure. I mean, if I'm just getting into the market, I would probably storefront stock. I would take a look. I would just, you know, put into Amazon backpack, get a sense of uh, the market. See, look for brands where there's a ton of different, a, a higher number of um, offers on there probably going to lean you into uh, brands that are OA friendly. And then we're just going to go backtrack from there. We're going to go find a product that has a little bit of a higher offer count, something above like five 
you're probably in an OA product and then just go find that. So, I mean, that's how I would start. And then once you find people that maybe have a few more reviews on those listings, then just go dive into those storefronts and you'll have a great catalog of products that you can go ahead and hunt for. Boom. Yeah. Right. So find an OA friendly listings. A really important thing to note is you don't source back to school products, or at least in my opinion, you shouldn't. You don't want to be buying and speculating. All you should be doing is buying stuff that's profitable today. Right. So, you know, if you guys have any back to school questions too, for anyone who's listening live, drop them in the chat too. We'll do a Q and A in a couple of minutes. But in general, you don't source for back to school. You just source profitable products that sell great today. Right. It's a hell of a lot harder to go in, especially as a new seller and find profitable soccer gear as opposed to profitable products, right? Cause soccer gear restricts you like nuts, right? But for most people, you know, you guys should just be doing storefront stocking, right? Taking a look at what other sellers are carrying, right? And then dialing in and trying to figure out where they're getting them and then making those listings profitable, right? So what are some of those methods guys that beginners should be using to uh, manufacture margin and create profitable listings? Cause very few things are gonna be profitable just at the advertised price. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for starters, FBM, a lot of times, especially with a lot of these things that we're talking about, makes it more profitable, right? Anything less than a pound, it's going to be more profitable FBM than FBA, right? So if you toggle that FBM, FBA yep. filter and, and sell ramp. On sell ramp, you have to make sure you do that. It's not just the standard profit calculator minus shipping. Sorry to interrupt you, buddy, but you scroll down and click to toggle on FBM and then put in that shipping cost. So we start there, right? That is that is the the, the first off. From there... Right. We can start talking about maybe discounted gift cards, maybe writing into customer support, asking for a new sign up code or a 10 percent code. They always have one of those in their back pocket. It's just whether they want to give it to you or not. Right. From there, um, obviously, you can start to compare different sites, maybe a price match from. from oh, um, come on. Oh, come on. We're putting them on to that, too. I love that. <laughs> Add a boy. Givati Vans. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you can start to price match maybe one site that's out of stock to a different site that is not out of stock, but maybe a regular priced. Um, um, what else am I missing? The tax free prep center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Catch all catch all coupons, right? So we'll just go from the top, right? So evergreen email account and tech sign up coupons, right? Um, hidden coupons you can just find on Google. If you want a great example of that, Google Shop WSS coupons, right? Items with multiple listings, very important, right? Because that increases your upside and decreases your risk, right? Holiday sales like Prime Day going on right now. Um, this time your sales tax holidays filtering to merchant fulfilled using a tax-free prep center, uh, top cash back and card bear for gift cards, really underrated. Right. Um, and then the coupon extensions too. you know, capital and shopping coupon birds, be frugal, retail me not, uh, stacking on cash back. Not, not a fan of adding that to the margin, but definitely a big fan of it as well. Right. Rewards programs like Kohl's cash too. Right. So just really understanding that very few items are going to be profitable at the advertised price. You're going to have to make listings profitable, which is a little bit difficult the first couple of times you do it. But the key is that it's difficult to all new sellers. So once you know how to do it well and you're actually looking at those extensions, you're actually talking to other sellers that are in the game, figuring out coupon codes for different websites. You understand how rack room coupon stacking works and these different retailers and then how the rewards program works and whether or not they have gift cards it becomes a lot easier to find SKUs here. Right, which is uh, which is pretty cool too in general as well. Right now, what should you get on gated in? Gonna keep this one quick. Only the stuff you find profitable. Only the stuff you Only find. Only the stuff you find profitable. Right, uh, getting on gated in something you haven't already found profitable, it's a complete waste of time. Right, and, and waste of money too. Waste of money too. Fact. Right. I mean, in, in general, is it gonna hurt? No, you got some sales at break even, whatever. But you just don't need to be doing it, in my opinion. Right. So the best things to get on gated in for back to school. Whatever you're finding profitably, hint, hint, that's going to be Crayola, Under Armour, Converse, Jordan, uh, any of the other brands that sellers are carrying those, Nike and Adidas, if you've you know got those on Gated too, right? Uh, whatever else other folks are selling is what you should be selling, that you can see people making money on. If they got in their storefronts, use Seller Amp storefront stocking, nice and easy, right? Don't worry and about all that stuff. A huge point, and this isn't necessarily pertaining to this topic, but just in general, Make sure we are documenting and organizing every single bit of data, every single product you find, because it's going to compound your business exponentially, right? Next July, next August, well, your job is half as hard, right? Because all the work you put in this year is now organized, concise, and ready to be acted upon next year and then the year after. Because a lot of these, if you go back to any backpack listings, Crayola listings, 
if you expand your keeper chart and see maybe not the past three months, maybe the past year or the past couple years, you see that cyclical nature in the sales rank. You see that up and down of the buy box. These sorts of things are happening year after year after year after year, right? So wouldn't it make sense to start to document all the listings that we're finding and acting on this year? And so next July, well, now you have a base to act on, right? So start to store, start to bookmark the sellers that are really crushing at this back to school. Start to organize all your links at the buy cost, at the prospective sell price with the expected velocity, all those sorts of things. And so next year, you're ready to act on, right? If you end up buying 100 Crayola crayons and you sell them in a day, write it down so next year you know to buy 200 or 300, right? The more organized you can be, it's going to make your life so much easier. Yeah, so sell, sell, ramp, sell ramp Google Sheets for Let's that stuff, the right? They got the, the crowd out there. Got you, got you, yeah. <laughs> we right, have an so sell ramp Google Sheets, right, integration, and then uh, keep a tracking alert. It's going to be huge for that kind of stuff. Now, the cool thing is if you're FBMing heavy, you can restock stuff super quick, right? And then if you see people crushing it, if you see a listing going to the moon or you take a look at back-to-school types of items from last year that went to the moon, go to the data buy box statistics on Keepa, filter to 365-day view, right? And uh, then you'll be able to storefront stock those sellers that are smart, that sold at the peak last year. You can take a look at what they're selling this year because those people are going to have other friendly listings. Another good that's huge. That's huge. That's huge. Oh, Before yeah. we move on, right? The keeping the keep a tracking alerts are huge, right? So maybe you have your eye on a, a Crayola crayon that's you know buy cost fifty cents or whatever, and you know you can pick it up in stock at Staples or whatever the case may be. You don't want to have to be monitoring that listing every single day or the backpack listing that you know you can buy for thirty that you're just waiting for it to get to seventy, waiting for it to get to sixty, waiting for it to get to fifty five. Every every listing that you have some sort of perspective scenario that you're waiting for, just set the keep a trappy, tracking alert, right? So on a listing, you can get a text message, you can get an email, you can get a notification that says, when this listing, when the third-party buy box gets to 60, I'm going to get an email or text right to my phone that says, oh, it's game time. Go buy that listing. Go buy that stock, whatever the case may be, right? So that's going to make your job so, so much easier because now you have keep a tracking 15, 20, 10 different listings that you know you can win on given the right parameter. Now, of course, every single one's not going to operate how you hoped, but half of them may, a quarter of them may. And so if you could beat that, beat all of the other sellers to the punch, maybe clear out the stock before they even notice the market's good, uh, you're going to increase your chances and increase your profits a lot this next couple of months. Yep. And really just buy as the market adjusts, right? Listen to the market, what the market's telling you. If the price is going up on something, competition's going down, people are making money on it. Right. If uh, if the offer counts going up and the price is going down, people are not as happy as they want to be on that listing. Right. Which is super, super important as well. Uh, another good tip. Shout out uh, Dylan Carter for this uh, term. Haven't heard it in about six years, but uh, leaf sourcing. Right. So uh, don't really know the correlation there, but uh, to do what's called leaf sourcing, you search on Amazon and let the Amazon algorithm tell you what's selling well based on a certain set of keywords. So, for example, if you want to find Adidas soccer products, the most, honestly, low-key, the most logical way to do that is to just search Adidas, an Adidas, soccer, on Adidas soccer on Amazon <laughs> and say, hey, Amazon, what's selling best in that niche, right? And then they're going to pop up listings that customers are buying. This is the most sophisticated customer-facing algorithm in the world, right? Besides TikTok, most likely there's you know something along those lines, right? Um, so that's a really, really good way to do product research as well, just hitting main keywords, right? So like you can do like, chat GPT, what types of stuff sells well during back to school. And you'll get a bunch of keywords, type in the keywords on Amazon or put them in on keep a product finder with an offer count minimum of 10 to sh find strictly reseller friendly listings. Right. But if you're doing the leaf sourcing method on Amazon, which is what it is, you, you want to add in a brand so that you're only looking up reseller. Friendly is that first word leaf up. as in like with leaf, a tree? like the tree man? I mean, I could be wild and right, but this is a, you know, I, I watched a lot of the, uh, a lot of the live sourcing in uh, in his Facebook group back in the day, man. So yeah, got a Facebook sourcing. Interesting. Got to, there's got to be some nerdy reason that he says right? that. It's just lit though, right? And, and the key too is going along with that, right? Another thing I learned from him is that you can drag the so like if you say you have say like Yankee Candle for example, like a specific type of Yankee Candle item where they have a standardized retail price on the website or sale price on the website, you can hit the keyword for that type of candle and then drag the pricing minimum up to where it's profitable. And then all the profitable variations will show in the search, right? The different colors and stuff. So that's a pretty good way to source as well too. And, uh, and everything. 
that's pretty much it in terms of like back to school. You know what I mean? Like the people that win big for back to school are factoring all the discounting methods. They're listing on multiple listings. They're getting stuff listed instantly FBM. They're going harder during their sales tax holiday, right? They're connected with other sellers and they're masterminding in Discord and Zoom calls and group chats to work on the stuff together. They're documenting their progress on social media, which is showing people their story and opening them up to potential, you know, opportunities down the line, right? You know, so, uh, you know, really just like, the winners and losers of back to score are the people that are going to really, really take it seriously and implement, you know, all the stuff we just talked about and, and be open to changing on the fly, not being afraid of going and doing some retail arbitrage of OA is a little dry for you, not being afraid to slide into our DMS and ask questions, right? Not being afraid to post questions on Twitter, et cetera, and build out their personal brand, which is going to bring people to them, you know? Well, and the, the, and we haven't even necessarily completely tied it to it, but like, the, the one of the biggest benefits, honestly, with the RA to, to FBM combo is like that capital flexibility, right? It gives you so much more leverage on your money. So a lot of people listening to this may be restricted, maybe only have 10, 15,000 to spend on a credit card, maybe only have 10,000, whatever the case may be, right? That gives you so much more reason to act with speed across five different listings, picking them up in store, listing them FBA, right? Because it saves you three weeks on top of that shipping into FBA. It saves you all sorts of time and it allows you to really maximize and stretch out that 5,000 that you have. Boom. That's what's up. Cool. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much everything you guys need to know with back to school. We do have some questions from the audience, um, as, as well here. Um, so let's, uh, let's dig in on a couple of these here too, as, as well. Let's see. We're going to get calculators at the cheapest price. Wherever um, so, yeah. Wherever Google shows, you know, I mean, seller makes the job so easy for us. Pull up a calculator on Amazon, press that Google button, and it's going to give you seven places to buy that calculator. Yep. All those sites have different discount codes available, have different coupon codes, sales cycles, all those different things. Um, and so that's going to be the kind of the best way to go about it. Let seller dictate where you're buying things for. And again, that's the benefit of reverse sourcing in general, not even for back to school, is that when you're when I'm sourcing on Nike manually, I'm pinned pigeonholed just to Nike. Where if I'm starting with that Nike product on the Amazon, now SellerAmp allows me to get exposed to four different sites I know, three that I haven't heard of, two that I think are sketchy, and one that I've never even seen before. You know what I'm saying? And so that reverse sourcing allows a lot more capability with just from a, a supplier chain perspective. Yep. Uh, what does uh, suppressed mean in the buy box? It means there's no buy box. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you should avoid a SKU like that, but if you can still see movement in that, you should totally sell it. Right. Typically, no buy box listings have recently gone up in price too. Um, not always though. Um, now, so we don't have accounting functionality in Boxum yet, but it's on the way. Um, Target, the only store to get ungated for products. Uh, no, Target's a great site, but there's uh, pretty much every other, uh, you know, every other uh, big website you can use for ungating as well. Yeah. What does suppress mean? Did you already do that one? Yeah. Yeah. Top four back to school products. Um, honestly, I don't think that question really helps you. Um, it, it, sh you should really just be hunting for stuff that's profitable, right? Cause it's way easier to find profitable shoes, right? Cause there's literally tens of thousands of shoe listings or hundreds of thousands than it is to find profitable calculators, for example, right? You want to just store front stock, right? Uh, but in terms of best products, purely back to school focus, soccer gear, football gear, crayons, backpacks, um, school supplies, which kind of like a fifth one. I mean, the other thing is, right, a good product for you may not be a good product for someone else based on the discount codes you know or based on the sales you know or based on the, the gift card you have access to, right? So a good product for me is not equivalent to yours. Um, and so because of that, right, different people can kind of – that's why, you know, price points are always going to be variable, right? And so allow yourself to have the flexibility to kind of work for that extra $2 off, $1.50 off, whatever you need to make something that may be mediocre to really good. Yep. Can you help with shipping template for FBM? Yep. For free and economy orders, do zero dollars. So make it free or standard and economy. And then for next day, two day and expedited, do something expensive like 20, 30, 50 dollars plus a dollar per pound to make sure you never get screwed on that stuff. Right. Can I use poly mails to ship Crayola crayons to customers? Um, ah, I don't know. Uh, not really sure if they'll break. Um, low key for five bucks, you could just order from someone else on Amazon and uh, like see what happens in terms of just like seeing how Amazon ships them out themselves. Um, like to customers, you just got to do your best judgment um, in terms of that, um, you know, in terms of what types of uh, supplies to use for that kind of stuff. Most things will be good in polymellers though. Yeah. Okay. So last question here as well. 
Um, OA sourcing, I'm new. Do you have any advice for me doing OA without invoice suspension? Yeah, you'll just use retail invoices for that um, or retail receipts. I've done literally hundreds of inauthentic complaints, not a single one or maybe a couple, but most of them were just using receipts from Dick's Sporting Goods, from Kohl's, et cetera, Nike.com. Good to go on that kind of stuff um, and everything. So we all have a 45 to 6 day period to really, really get to it. Um, this is when Pete, Gary, and I all had our first 100,000 hour months. Pete last year, Gary and I three years ago. Right there. If you guys got any questions, our DMs are open on socials. And uh, follow Pete's Flips, all platforms, Prep Talk Podcast as well. Mm -hmm. All out Amazon. Garrett or Al on YouTube. Garrett, you're back with the YouTube videos too? Every week, baby. Every, every week, right? Check it out. Garrett or Al right there. Right. No one's getting married soon. So, you know, luckily we got G body events back. Hunting was good. <laughs> and everything. We got a lot more podcasts coming for you guys. Appreciate y'all watching the live episode and listening on the uh, the replay as well. We're here to help. Tons of YouTube live streams coming down, tons of podcast episodes. If you want us to bring on different people, let us know. We'll see you on the next one. Be great.